On this clinical slash performance insight, we're going to talk about the importance of external rotation. Um, if you're listening to this on the podcast, the video going along with this has a couple images that we'll walk through and talk about um, and do our best to explain, but also has some clips of some exercises that we like to start. And then as we eventually progress into regaining that strength through the external rotators of the shoulder and the hip and getting everything to function. Um, as we would hope it would again. So check it out on YouTube. Uh, check it out on clinicallypress.com underneath our clinical and performance insight. We'll put it in both places uh, if you want to see those videos. But this is one that I feel like I generally as a clinician and in the sports performance world generally knew was always important but probably never actually really got the grasp of it till going to a couple of DNS courses or dynamic neuromuscular stabilization uh, with Kyle of the podcast. Um, and that just took it to a whole new level in terms of understanding the evolution of movement as it comes from when you're born, as you go through the developmental stages as an infant and beyond. And now currently having my own eight and a half month old watching these progressions um, and the things that she is able to do that somewhere long, long ago along the way, I lost the ability to, and quite frankly, haven't done a very good job of getting back. So one thing, and Kelly Starrett also talks about this a lot in The Supple Leopard, is there, there's a lot of benefit to having really good, strong external rotators that are functioning and working. We're going to just kind of talk through some of the basics of that. One of the basic cues that he talks about, and a lot of people talk about, is this external rotation of screwing in effect of both the hip and the shoulder. Now, the hip and its anatomy and how it's set up is a much more stable, fairly mobile, but very stable joint compared to the shoulder. But creating that external rotation by utilizing all the external rotators of the hips and your glutes can help really lock that position joint into kind of a quote-unquote closed pack position, good and strong, and really help you develop more strength and power coming out of that, especially when we're thinking about squatting. It can also do tremendous things for your posture, that even if you're standing there and you externally rotate your glutes, you can feel that screwing in mechanism of screwing your heels into the floor to then have it externally rotate kind of the rest of your leg which can ultimately go all the way down to your feet, helping in recreating an arch by getting your posterior uh, tibial flexors to get engaged. Um, on the image on the screen right now, we're looking at somebody with very exaggerated valgus in a squat where the knees are diving in, kind of neutral where we're getting that good screw-in mechanism with our heels and getting our hips engaged, and then a varus one where we're kind of going excessively to the outside of it and really getting those engaged. Same thing happens with our shoulders. Very mobile joint, not necessarily ball and socket, but ball on T is a good way to think about it if you think about golf and just how that humeral head sits in that uh, glenoid fossa to sit there and create the shoulder joint. Hard to get a lot of stability out of that other than with the muscles. And so, again, thinking about that screw-in mechanism of when you're doing push-ups or if you're bench pressing, a common cue is to think about bending the bar and really getting that joint as close and tight as it can be when you're in those positions. Now, how does that relate all the way back to the baby movement we were talking before? These are natural movements that get stronger as a baby learns to move. And we tend to seem to lose that as we sit in chairs more or as we grow up, even in our very young ages. But we lose the ability to engage our external hip rotators to prop ourselves up from the floor. And those will come in a couple of the examples here in just a minute with the exercises or being able to lay on our side, have our arm, our arm out in front of us, and use the external rotators of the shoulder to help prop us up to our elbow. Now, if you do those now, and again, the couple of examples we're going to have Kyle demonstrating in the video here shortly, without cheating or using momentum, it's really, really hard. And 
that's part of just, again, things that we lose as we move into more sports and we look at the bigger training and, you know, we spend more time sitting in chairs and we get less active engaging those specific posterior chain muscles. And that's really what was eye-opening about the DNS course because it is stuff that you can learn and retrain and it's something we've had a lot of success with in working mainly on the rehab clinical side but really can have an impact on performance. I still remember it very vividly in that uh, the person, uh, Dr. Brett Winchester, who's also been on the podcast talking about DNS, was teaching the course talking about how with the professional pitchers he works with, if they've got a trigger point that he feels in their pack, instead of going right at that with soft tissue work, you'll actually run through a DNS-based progression of exercises to get the posterior shoulder to turn back on in quotes and get those muscles activated and going run through that actually go back to check on that trigger point and often find that it's not no longer there as the body has now kind of reset itself because the muscles are doing what we need them to do on the posterior side which is then allowed that trigger point which may have developed as a protective mechanism to no longer be there to not feel that tight position so the importance of that and the thought process of looking at something like that and not necessarily treating potentially just the symptom of the trigger point but actually going in and really trying to address the underlying issue and the fascination of what the body can do to correct itself now for some of the exercises and this may be where it's worth going and checking out the video um all of these videos are uh, scattered around our YouTube channel and also on clinicallyprepressed.com. But for the hip specifically, we start really simple with a sideline external hip rotation just to really focus on getting those muscles isolated and working and having that control. Um, in the video, we have it without a band. You can definitely add a band. You can get creative with holding isometrics at the end, focusing on the eccentric, but it's a great exercise to just start focusing on those external rotators of the hip. We then take that one just a slightly bit further and actually are going to address the whole hip where we do a side-lying hip internal rotation when you've already got it lifted up into a little bit of abduction and an external rotation. So you're really getting the entire hip here. And again, it forces you to build in that control. Um, this one is probably easier to go and check out the video um, as the description is not as easy to lay out there. The hip external rotation with the mini band standing is one of my favorite exercises to go to. Um, really, you're in a standing position. You're isometrically keeping one hip in place while then doing internal and external rotation with the other hip. Really, I like to go to a burn on this one. I think it's a great exercise as you're in an athletic stance. Um, this one paired with some really focused lateral band walks or even monster walks can be really good. Um, to engage the hip. Then we move into Kyle demonstrating an oblique sit, which is part of the DNS um, kind of functional progression in one of their exercises. And this is where, again, when I say it looks like it's not something that would be overly complex, but you've got to build the mobility to get into that position, but then the control to be able to use the external rotators of the hip and not momentum to get you to have that movement from going from a sitting position because you're in kind of a pigeon s position to then be able to raise up and sit in a, an oblique sit position again this is the stuff that if you go and you're able to watch an infant you'll be amazed that they're able to do this and not really even stress or strain over it Whereas, again, for us to do it, it is quite the feat, um, unless you've practiced it and focused on it. I've seen some very, very strong people that struggle with this, and that's nothing to, against their strength. It's just that hard to utilize those tiny muscles.
Moving on to the shoulders, um, huge focus for me has been lately is obviously the external rotators of the shoulders. We talk about the rotator cuff, uh, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, but I think another really important aspect of it is to engage some of those retraction muscles, so your rhomboids, the middle and lower portions of your trap. And so with this bent over A's that we have, it's really trying to focus on depressing the shoulders, not engaging upper trap, and getting those muscles to engage between your shoulder blades same with um doing w's for the shoulders you can do these either bent over or laying down uh, in a prone position on the floor and this will engage all of the external rotators of the shoulder plus really focus on some of those retraction muscles between your shoulder blades kind of moving beyond that going to dr kyle again a great starting one is this serratus activation exercise that's being shown. So he's kind of in a heel sit position and quadruped, elbows directly under shoulders, scaps set down and back. So upper traps are turned off and has a l very light resistance band in his hands and just doing the smallest amount of external rotation to engage all of those external rotators and holding that external rotation for two to three breaths whole other part of the dns aspect of work, working on that 360 breathing this is huge for getting some activation and one that i like to utilize quite often early in the process before we start moving on to the next exercise that we'll walk through here in a second this one's fantastic. If you can keep pecs turned off, you can keep upper trap turned off, you're going to get a great amount of activation and really feel that, which is great for the um, patient to feel as well. So this low oblique sit, shoulder sideline exercise, this is one of the exercises that I referenced earlier with the pitchers and trying to really get everything to engage on the posterior side of the shoulder. This can have so many variations. Uh, Kyle is going through the entire um, motion of this exercise, but at the same time, you can go and just hold in position isometrically as they're pushing back. You can go and just do eccentrics or you can work through the whole motion. The setup is imperative on this one. Um, really what you're trying to do is help the humeral head slide back onto its rightful place um, within the joint focusing on that joint centration. Uh, once you get there, it is very important to get in a good spot to make sure that your pec and your upper trap are not turning on during this exercise. The goal is to be able to utilize all of the external rotators and supporting muscles of the shoulder and not compensate with pec and or the upper trap. So as you're watching this, exercise if you get on to our channel or check out this video you'll see dr kyle actually you know poking around in his pec and his upper trap to make sure they're not turning on that there's not getting tension through there and that that is allowing him to do this exercise as efficiently as possible so ultimately this may not be a huge surprise to most people about the importance of external rotation but i think it's something that can potentially just be overlooked as we get into all the different options we have in terms of caring treating or training an athlete um, ideas get shifted goals get um, moved to a different aspect and where they fall in the importance of things and again that's not to say anything is right wrong or otherwise but i think it's always a good reminder for me to come back to these and really focus on this and not get too caught up again on if pain is in one location is that truly why it's occurring um, or if it's just a symptom of something much bigger um, and so this is just kind of my friendly reminder with a couple tips and ideas that might be useful to help get that back in the hips and the shoulders. I think it's helped me a ton in terms of looking at how we train our athletes, but also how we help them get back um, if they are having some pain or they have an injury um, and really just gets more out of it for us in the long run when we're focusing on these areas, making sure they're strong, activated, doing what they need to do in order to help the body and the person ultimately perform at the highest level. 
Hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you're just listening to this, highly recommend checking it out. We'll have it bo- posted at both places in our insights at clinicallypressed.com. It's over to the right-hand side. It's a drop-down. You'll see it in the clinical and the performance for the insights. Um, appreciate you all taking the time, and we'll talk to you soon.